so in this video I'm going to look at collisions. So I'm going to look at them in the context of momentum, and then we're going to look at Newton's law of collisions. So let's start off with a bit of a recap. So some thing, key things you need to remember. So the momentum of an object is the mass of an object times the velocity of the object. That's how you calculate it. And this is a vector quantity because it's made up of a constant and another vector, your velocity. So your momentum needs to have both direction and also magnitude. So impulse is very closely tied to momentum because an impulse is something that causes the momentum of an object to change. And you can calculate an impulse by multiplying force and time if the force is constant throughout that period of time. It's a nice simple equation if you know that force is constant. However, most of the time you cannot assume force is constant. So you have to do the graphical equivalent of multiplying, which is integration. So what you do is you integrate the force, and we're using Newton's second law, so force is the rate of change of momentum here. And we're integrating it with respect to t, and when you do that, what you'll see is that the impulse ends up being the change of momentum, so the final momentum minus the initial momentum. Like that's where it comes from. So if you, say, have a graph of how the force changes with time, like this, the impulse that acts on the object will be the area like this. And you, that's another way you can calculate what the impulse is. So you, that's two strategies you've got. You've got this numerical method, or you've got this graphical method, or this is a general case here. And so let's put this to use so you can see it works in a question. All right, so what we've got is we've got uh, two rules like this. It's like a, a classic um, cl uh, conservation momentum type problem where you end have two rules. So we have a 2 and a 5. We'll put those in afterwards. And in terms of velocities, we've got it going at 4 in that direction, we've got it going at 0 in that direction. 2 kilogram ball ends up being stationary, and we're interested in, well, if we're going to work out what the impulse is, we're going to need to think about what the B is. So if we look at the momentum, like before and after, so it's going to be 4 times 2 plus 0 times 5, and that's going to go to 0 times 2 plus 5 times V. So if we uh, concentrate all of that, we end up with 8 on this side going to 5V, which means the velocity is equal to 8 over 5. So the momentum of the 5 kilogram um, afterwards would be the mass times velocity, so times 8 over 5. which is 8 kilogram meters per second. So you'll notice actually we could have stopped at this stage here because this would be the final momentum. So remember, impulse is the change in momentum. So that's going to be 8 minus 0 because it started off stationary. So that's 8 kilogram meters per second is the impulse that acts on the object. So here we have it sort of like typed out and written up. So you can see that in case you couldn't read anything. So essentially the stages we've gone through, we calculated the total momentum before, the total momentum after. Momentum always has to be conserved, so you know those this and this are equal to each other. So you can solve to find the velocity of, I really should have picked a symbol other than P here, I don't know why I picked P, that's just stupid. But anyway, uh, you end up with a velocity of 1.6, you multiply the velocity by the mass, gives you the momentum, 
The change in momentum is 8 kilogram meters per second. Impulse is the change in momentum, therefore the impulse is 8 kilogram meters per second. Okay, so that's that. So let's have a look at Newton's law of collision. So, one of the things we need to think about in this is that actually um, mechanical energy is rarely 100% conserved. So we've up until this point in the M2 we've assumed that it is, but Actually, it's often wasted as things like heat and sound and other such things. But always, 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 momentum must be conserved. It doesn't matter what happens in a collision, momentum has to be conserved. And, but what Newton's law of impact says is actually you can calculate the speed an object will move away from a collision by knowing something with the coefficient of restitution, and you can actually know what that is between different materials. And so the coefficient of restitution is the relationship between the speed of approach and the speed of separation. But it act only acts on things perpendicular to the impact surface. So what that means is, say we have a ball and it's going this way, normal to it. Then let's say it's going in V. So then what that's saying is the speed U would be the coefficient of times V. Now, an alternative would be is if it's like this at an angle theta. So what we would do is resolve that into its two parts, like this. So let's say it was going to be so v cosine theta v sine theta. So the the collision does not act on this component, so this component will remain fixed throughout the problem because it's actually perpendicular. Well, it's actually going parallel to the surface here, so the like friction or whatever else is causing this has no impact on this. So this stays the same. But what you would say is that let's say it's going to rebound at this at a new angle theta. So u cosine theta two would be equal to v cosine theta times your coefficient of restitution. So it only acts on the perpendicular component, which is this one here. So you multiply that by e, that will give you the perpendicular component of the rebound angle, like that. So let's see that used in an example. So we've got a ball travelling at 4 meters per second, and it collides with a wall at an angle of 30 degrees. And what we want to do is calculate the magnitude and direction of the velocity after the collision if your coefficient of restitution, or your E, is 0.8. So the first thing we need to do is we need to split this um, up into its parallel components. So let's call them letters so they're easy to refer to. So V is going to be for sine 30 and sine of 30 is a half, so let's write that as 2 straight away. And u is going to be for cosine 30. Cosine of 30 is root 3 over 2, so that's going to be equal to 2 root 3 meters per second, like that. Um, so when we think it's going to rebound, it's going to go off somewhere like that and I'm going to say your the angle is that one that that to match up with what we've got before and let's give that components a and b so we know the coefficient of restitution only acts on the perpendicular so it's only going to impact on b so b is going to be calculated by e times v which is 0 0.8 times 2 gives you 1.6. We know that A is going to be equal to U because the coefficient of restitution doesn't act on parallel components. So if we want to calculate your the, the magnitude, we're going to need to use our rules of vector addition. Like this. Uh, if you plug that into your calculator, you should end up with 3.82 meters per second as to 
uh, the direction or theta. Uh, we just do a quick sketch. We've got theta in there. We've got uh, 1.6 and we've got 2 root 3 there. So we've got opposite and adjacent. So to get our theta, we're going to use a tan rule. Opposite over adjacent. And that's going to give us 24.8 degrees for the angle that we marked on the diagram. So that's that problem fit. So here it is typed out, so let's just quickly have a look. So what we did, we calculated the velocity perpendicular to the wall and parallel. We know that the coefficient of restitution only acts on the perpendicular component, so we can work out the rebound perpendicular component, whereas the parallel component must stay constant. We used our laws of vector addition to calculate the magnitude and our tan law to work out the angle there. And that's the problem, and that's the introduction to momentum and collisions.